Welcome to the Northeast Kingdom Voice. I'm your host, Scott Wheeler. Today's guest is Carol Bushy, the Executive Director of Northeast Kingdom Human Services. Welcome to the show, Carol. Thank you very much, Scott. Glad to be here. Hey, my first question is for you. Uh, you're now Northeast Kingdom Human Services, but at one, for many years you were Northeast Kingdom Mental Health. Yes. When, when was the change? Uh, I think the change might have been back in 1999, um, but we changed our name because um, we were we do more than mental health service. We provide addiction services and we provide an extensive amount of services to individuals with developmental disabilities. And so the title of our agency or the name of the agency was a little deceiving because we were not just a mental health agency. We were a community agency serving folks with uh, mental health issues, substance abuse issues, and developmental issues. Right. You know, uh, I, probably a lot of people remember your agency, agency when it was located over near the high school, right, yes. and uh, having actually done a stint at work in there while I was in college and a few years after, um, you, you know, sometimes I think agencies sometimes overbuild, or they could stay in their current building. You were oper you were tight in that building. You were in desperate need of a new building. Yes, we were, we were squeezed out of space and and a, a number of folks probably identified us with that building on broadview avenue however um, that housed our outpatient and our administrative offices for the in the newport area however we had our developmental services and uh, off-site up by citizens utilities we had our um, crt which is our community rehabilitation and treatment program up at the old bogner building um, and we had people housed in a variety of different places and the same was our situation down in st johnsbury now uh, i know a <coughs> bit about the history just because i know george coulter and he, mm -hmm. uh, is he the last founder still living here um my guess would be yes i i couldn't say that for absolute sure but my guesses would be yes right. so Tell us a little bit about the history that you know. Well, the agency was started in 1960 uh, with one individual who was doing some uh, therapy. And uh, it grew from there, uh, from 1960 to, to today. Uh, we have over 540 employees. Uh, back then we started with one and it just kept building up. Um, we uh, serve about 3,800 clients a year. That's actually people that get open to us and receive services. That doesn't count individuals that we would be serving through consultation and outreach and uh, by virtue of if we're working with a family, we might be serving an identified child, uh, but the other people in the family or the other relatives would be getting some outreach from that um, service as well. So active clients, open, uh, it's about 3,800 a year. Now, is that between your uh, your Newport building and your Yes, St. we're Jasper? responsible for the Northeast Kingdom, the three counties of the Northeast Kingdom. So those individuals would be served through those three counties. Um, we have two main sites. We have the one here in Derby, up behind the Community National Bank, and we have another office pretty much the same size down in St. Johnsbury across from the old Fairbanks um, scale building out on um, kind of Route 2 down there. So that houses our outpatient services and our administration, and uh, we have a, uh, a lot of community-based staff that have office space there that come in to do some work and then are primarily in the community. Uh, because the bulk of the services we provide are provided in individuals' homes, in schools, in child care centers, in, uh, at the hospital, in, in doctor's offices. Um, so. So you're really community-based. You, you, it doesn't sound like you have a lot of people who actually sit behind a desk all day long. No, no. I mean, primarily the people that are behind the desk are the people that work in our business office, that do all our billing and our payroll and all of that, and the, the, um, our support staff that are uh, 
sitting at the front desk, welcoming people in, calling people and doing that. And the outpatient therapists, we have clinicians, uh, you know, master's level clinicians, licensed clinicians, we have psychiatrists, psychiatric nurses, and those individuals would be seeing people um, just like you'd go to the doctor and have a visit with your doctor, people would be coming in for those visits. Um, and then the rest of the staff is out doing um, services, serving people in the home, helping people uh, navigate through the community, helping people get to other appointments. Um, and again, we have a large number of staff that work in the schools within the Northeast Kingdom. Now, when we talk about the history of the agency, now you weren't there from the, the beginning, but you're, you've been there for, <laughs> well, you basically, have you been there your entire work in life? Pretty, yeah, pretty much, yes. I, I, I did start in 1973, very fortunate to start in 1973, and we were, we had just added on to the um, old Broadview building shortly after that because we were down on the Glen Road uh, with the Vershire Schools and Shops. That was a sheltered workshop that we had back in the day. Um, and that Was that the old, uh, the old Fidelis building? Yes, oh, yes, really? yeah, okay. that's where that was. And we had a sheltered workshop there, and we had one in St. Johnsbury, and we had one in Colebrook. And uh, the... Uh, clients and participants would make wooden toys, we would sell the wooden toys, we fixed uh, bicycles, we fixed lawnmowers, um, did a little bit of small engine repair stuff and that was uh, an activity that gave folks um, who couldn't work um, full-time something to do and, and to kind of learn a skill as well as back back at that point um, uh, uh, teenagers who had um, a developmental disability which then was called mental retardation uh, were not allowed in the high schools so we had programming for um, teenagers that weren't weren't allowed in in school at the time now since then obviously they've they've taken care of that and the laws have changed and so you've kids are a, now in school yeah you've seen a tremendous amount of change not only at human services but also societal changes yes yeah Yes, yeah, I, I have, and, and yet still the, the stigma remains, and, um, uh, and, and as much as we have tried to uh, kind of reduce that and welcome people in, there's, there is still some hesitation on, on the behalf of some folks to accept help and treatment. Um, I think the other part for us is that um, our work is very confidential, and, and we don't publicize a lot of things that we do because we really want to preserve the confidentiality of the folks we work with so then on one side folks don't really understand what we do do and how much we uh, how much service we provide and and the kind of safety net that we provide to the communities that we serve right. yeah so that must be a challenge because it's a it's that catch-22 you need the privacy but then uh, you're also uh, subject to a uh, to funding which mm -hmm. requires, if I recall right, you also go to towns and each yes. year. And um, is, is that a, is that a struggle getting money, or do they do most people understand? Well, um, we do get money from I think sixty eight towns um, on an annual basis right. if if it all gets passed at town meeting. Um, we have a number of towns that don't require the petitions with the signatures um, and as long as in some towns as long as you're not asking for more money and you've been receiving that same amount you don't have to do the petitions um, it it is a struggle to get the signatures only because um, it's it's not there's no like one place you can kind of go and stand um, and what we're asking people to do is sign the petition so that we can get on the warning we're not asking them to say yes you should get this money it's base it's really about they support the organization they support us making this request of the town um, and if we get the money that we are asking for from each of the towns it adds up to about sixty six thousand dollars and that money we put toward our emergency response services um, which is a area that doesn't get sufficient funding we provide emergency uh, crisis services 24 hours of the day seven days a week to all of the communities in the Northeast Kingdom so if somebody's in a psychiatric crisis or a mental health crisis uh, we get the call we have people that are on call with pagers they respond to that they do screenings um, try to get the person the help that they need uh, we work closely with law enforcement we go with them on some of the calls that they make they if they're heading out to a call that they're considering might have some kind of a issue that maybe having one of our workers accompany them might prevent somebody from either 
getting arrested or going in the hospital, then our staff goes along and helps with that response. So it's a really valuable service. And so that's the, when we get money from the towns, that's where we put it. And I also know um, there has been a struggle most communities around the state ever since the issue with the uh, Waterbury State Hospital, uh, where mm -hmm. there it's 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 been proven difficult to uh, where to put some of these people. Uh, have you also faced that? Yes, I mean we work very closely with North Country Hospital and um, NVRH Northern Vermont Regional Hospital in St. Johnsbury. Um, we do have a two-bed diversion program in St. Johnsbury, so if somebody is screened um, and they don't really need to go to a psychiatric hospital but they need stabilization, we have um, two beds that can be um, utilized for short periods of time. I think the, the major crunch that we're facing with folks in the emergency room that need a psychiatric bed is that the psychiatric hospital that was built in Berlin um, obviously is smaller than the one that got flooded out. Um, and there's a number of people that are there that don't have the next place for them to go to. So there being some folks who could maybe leave there, they can't leave and go home, but they need another level of secure um, housing. There's no place for them to go, so that clogs that place up, so then you can't get the people that are showing up in your emergency rooms that need a psychiatric bed into those beds. And it's a statewide challenge. And I know um, the Agency of Human Services has a few options that they're looking at. Um, it's certainly something our agency put in a proposal a few years ago to do a secure residential program that would ease that, um, that tremendous burden that's happening. But um, at the time, the funding wasn't there to do anything with it. So. And I would imagine the NIMBY sim, uh, syndrome yeah. would also come in, uh, mm -hmm. not in my backyard. Right. You know, everybody knows there's a need, yeah. but there's, uh, there's not the, uh, you know, it's where do, where do we, we put it. Now, you also have another issue, well, I assume you do, because uh, the rest of the state does, is the opiate issue. Yeah. Does, uh, do you deal with an opiate addiction? Yeah, we do. Yes, we have a significant addictions uh, department within our agency. We do uh, um, outpatient, individual outpatient services. We do an intensive, we have an intensive outpatient program, which is um, nine hours a week. It's three times a week for three hours, which is intensive um, treatment for folks that are um, in recovery and, and addressing their treatment issues. Um, we have uh, one provider who uh, s prescribes Suboxone for folks that are uh, wanting to um, wean themselves off um, opiates. Um, we do the, um, what used to be called the crash program, it's now called the, um, I'm going to forget it now, it's IDRP, it's Impaired Driver uh, Rehabilitation Program. And we are now um, running that on the weekends so that people don't have to come once a week for X amount of weeks. You can now come and attend for the weekend and get it all done so that you can get your license back sooner so we've been uh, doing crash for a, a long time and this uh, weekend opportunity just came to us about a year ago so we're very pleased with that so you deal with both alcohol issues and yes the, the drug issue um, yeah. for, for children and for um, adolescents and adults right. mm -hmm. do you uh, like I've had a lot of different um, agencies on here including yours in the past is do you have a good working relationship with the other uh, human service type agencies, whether it like be NECA? Yes. Um, one of the things that has grown stronger over the past couple years is um, work that uh, our uh, community pro providers have done both in the St. Johnsbury area and the Newport area to build accountable care um, teams. And um, so we have um, representatives from leadership from the hospitals, from um, the uh, home health agencies from the um, uh, Council on Aging, from uh, Rural Edge, from the health departments, I'm going to forget somebody, um, all the different uh, NECA, all the different um, providers, uh, we get together on a regular basis and we have um, targeted uh, better health outcomes that we would that we feel as a group we can um, kind of address together and, and get more traction and get more um, action out of them. 
um, and ha we've had great success with that and so um, our, our partnerships and um, are very strong uh, we depend on each other and we look to each other to help each other out um, we advocate for each other um, there's a number of clients that we might share um, we've been working to uh, train our staff in in kind of a expanded care coordination model where um, it brings together representatives from providers um, not just within your own organization but if you if you're working with an individual and they have services that are coming from a primary care office from home health from maybe the sash program or wherever they're coming from that all of those people need to get together on a regular basis with that individual so the individual can be steering where they want their treatment to go so it's very client centered um, and uh, it's helping to reduce some of the challenges that maybe a primary care office might run into with a client who comes in or a patient who comes in and they don't have any housing but they're ending up at the primary care office which is not where they're going to get help around that so the more we all understand what we all do and what we're all responsible for the the better we can serve those individuals I suspect you probably have a struggle that many uh, agencies have where it, when it comes to trying to help people it's trying to first get them in your door mm -hmm. and to accept help because I uh, I have found that's the case with the uh, particularly amongst the aging population in the, the various groups that help the aging people is uh, they're very stoic sometimes and we can do this do you do you have that same thing about trying to get people to understand <coughs> we, you are there to help them and there's no there's nothing wrong with accepting help yeah I mean it's it's the stigma that we are still um, challenged with I think you know the more we can help people understand what we have to offer um, the more we can improve our response, uh, the more we can uh, shorten wait times, um, you know, all those things that we can do to better inform people and better respond to their needs will, will hopefully help people uh, see that um, the services that we have to offer are, are beneficial. We get um, very good uh, results from surveys that we do on an annual basis from the people that we serve about the benefits of the services that they receive. Uh, and sometimes what we're most challenged with is somebody's ready to get treatment and they call and we might just not ha be able to get them in that day or we might not be able to get them in that week and so by the time we can get them in they might have decided that they don't need it anymore um, which may not be the case but um, but our funding I, I, I did want to just kind of yep. clarify where our funding comes from we are a designated agency um, designated by the state of Vermont to uh, provide services to three mandated populations um, individuals with developmental disabilities um, adults that have a chronic and persistent mental illness and children that have a severe emotional disturbance those are three mandated populations and then within the contract that we have with the state we are allocated funding to serve other populations beyond that so uh, we have to operate within that budget within the allocation that we're given and we only get the money if we provide the service and we bill for it and the person has insurance and we get paid so um, we look for all kinds of other partnerships and areas where we can um, develop other resources for funding uh, because the funding that we get with in those uh, within that contract doesn't really cover all the the services that we provide and that that contract is with the Department of Mental Health and the Department of Aging and Independent Living and with the um, alcohol and drug abuse programs uh, I know one thing uh, like at the hospital they struggle to find professionals to mm -hmm. who want to live here like that's how come there's always a doctor shortage and such because you and I might love living here you know because mm -hmm. I think you were you were born and raised here right yep I moved away for a little while when I was a young child but yeah but you know I was born here yeah. for other people to move here it takes the right kind of person mm -hmm. no amount of money is gonna make you happy if this isn't do right. you do you struggle also with finding for the professional level yes. jobs yes um, we struggle most uh, 
in recruiting um, master's level licensed clinicians, um, as well as um, Med medication providers. We have a um, we have a full time psychiatrist um, and a part time psych. Well, actually, I actually have two full time psychiatrists and a part time psychiatrist, and then we have five um, APRNs, um, and we still don't have enough capacity. But we also don't have the resources to recruit and hire any more um, individuals because we just can't cover it. Um, but the licensed clinicians are are very hard to find. Um, the funding that we receive um, is not sufficient for us to really compete with uh, the hospitals or the schools or the state. So uh, we do, we are a training site. I've, I've said this for years, as frustrating as it is for us, we get a lot of folks that are early in their careers and we can provide them with really good training and very good supervision and they work through that supervision, they get licensed and then they leave and they go on to other jobs. Or we have um, bachelor level folks that come and they learn the case management, how to work closely with families or individuals that have um, very challenging uh, needs. And then um, once they really hone those skills, then they're recruited by our other community partners. But at the same time, when they leave us, they know our system, they know how to access services, they know how to help people connect with us. So. You know, I, it's, it's a community service that we fill, but we, we are very, very challenged in um, recruiting staff. You're, al you're also uh, looking to, you're also recruiting somebody to fill your seat. Yes, right yep, yep. I'm filling in um, as the executive director, and uh, we have a search committee that's actively uh, working to uh, recruit uh, some uh, candidates. Um, They've got the job posted. Um, they've been accepting applications. I believe that in the month of February, they're intending to maybe schedule, maybe late in February, some interview times to start the interview process. And we're hopeful that we will have um, a new executive director in place by June 1st. What's the ideal candidate look like? Uh, the ideal candidate would have uh, some good, strong knowledge of the populations that we serve um, because we serve pregnant women, little kids, uh, any child of any age, all the way up through um, elders um, with a variety of um, different disabilities or challenges or struggles. Um, so the individual really should have a good knowledge of, of the population that we serve. Um, it would be ideal if they knew the community because it's of utmost importance that the individual forge uh, strong relationships with our partners and be able to just kind of slip into this community work that we've been doing um, because uh, with changes in you know payment reform and how everything's going to go we don't know how everything's going to go into the future um, you can't just pull back in your own camp and and think you're going to be able to make it work you've got to be working with your um, partners and we've got to better integrate care and um, continue to look for efficiencies um, I think having some knowledge of where our funding comes from because we are probably 85% Medicaid funded. Um, we have some Medicare, we have a small amount of um, private insurance. Uh, we don't turn anybody away because they can't pay. So um, that's another little kind of juggling thing you have to do if people don't have insurance and they still need the service, we still need to provide the service to them. Um, you know, a commitment to um, looking at um, supporting our staff. We have a tremendous staff of dedicated and skilled people that um, have uh, longevity as well as folks that are just coming to us, you know, newly in their careers. Um, but folks work really, really hard uh, to support um, the clients that, that we um, serve. Um, despite their own personal challenges, they get up every day and come in and, and work with some individuals that, that have, you know, just insurmountable um, challenges ahead of them. But they, they struggle through it and they do the best they can do. So um, I think one of the things that's always worried me anytime anybody new comes in, I think it happens for everybody, is that, you know, you have things kind of set up and running and things are going pretty well and you worry that somebody new is going to come in and kind of 
turn it all upside down. So, so for me personally, and, and I'm not a part of the search committee, but one of my personal wishes would be that the individual would really um, appreciate the, um, the hard work and the efforts that the staff uh, is, is currently um, you know, putting forth and, and really appreciate that and, and take their time to kind of get to know how things are going before they just you know, were to make any major changes. Now, this is a long shot, is if there's any, because uh, uh, this show also, it goes on the radio, it goes on TV, it goes on the internet. If anybody's <laughs> sitting there and they're a mental health professional and they're looking, they're, you know, this is something that they might consider. How, how can, who do they reach out to? Well, they can certainly call me if they're, yeah. if they're at all interested. My number is... Three three four six seven four four, and they can get me at the agency. Um, we have a website that they can be checking out. Um, uh, where we have our jobs posted on jobs in Vermont. We have them in a variety of different places. Um, I mean, anybody who wants to know more about us, I'm more than happy to talk with them. They can either just call or they can come to the agency and kind of see where we are and hear more about us. So, are you retiring after, or are you? Yes. Yes. So you're Yep. new chapter of your life yep yep i was planning to retire in february but i stayed on um for um while we um recruit for a new executive director just had a recent transition with a change um and we're doing just fine and um uh things are i don't think our clients have certainly seen any uh, any bumps in the road by any means and our staff is doing a great job but uh, the search committee and the board um, is really optimistic that by June 1st we'll have somebody in place. So. Okay, we only have about four more minutes left. What more would you like to tell the people? Uh, we are governed by a board of directors. There are, it's a volunteer board, and 51% of our board um, is required by um, the rules that we have to operate under. They're required to either be a consumer of services or a family member who has um, somebody who may have received services. Um, and that's specifically written into the um, requirements for designation to make sure that all of the agencies similar to us are really um, having consumer voice involved with um, how the operations of the agency are, um, are running. Um, we also have a variety of steering committees that represent the four basic program areas. We have a division for children, youth, and families. We have a division for adults. We have a division for um, developmental and intellectual disabilities. Um, and our, our adult division has both a mental health side and an addiction side. So we have steering committees, four different steering committees, and those groups uh, really help look at um, services that are offered. Uh, they suggest things that, that maybe they're hearing that we could do differently or hearing concerns in the community. They help develop um, a system of care plan that we have to do every three years. Um, uh, so our, our board is, uh, is, is very, uh, it's a very dedicated board. Um, uh, they meet on a monthly basis. Um, and uh, they have other committees that they are actively working on. Like uh, right now, there's a, the search committee that's looking for the new executive director. They're having weekly meetings to try to keep everything moving forward and, and keep that process going. Um, I guess the other thing I could say is uh, we provide, like I said, we provide individual therapy and group therapy in our main buildings, but we provide a lot of uh, case management and um, group work in the communities. Uh, within the schools, we have homeschool coordinators, we have uh, school-based clinicians, we have um, behavioral interventionists that are working one-on-one -on -one with kids so that they can remain in their own schools. Um, those positions are a partnership that we developed with the schools oh boy, at least 20 something years ago, um, which really helps the schools increase the capacity to have um, behavioral health services within the school so parents don't have to leave work to take their child to an appointment because a clinician is right there in the school, as well as the homeschool coordinators can go in into the homes um, and work with the family. Uh, I would say in developmental services, we have uh, probably 300 home providers. Um, we 
really um, are very pleased that the model is set up that an individual can uh, live with a family, live just like you and I do. Uh, we're not putting people in large in large group homes. We have some very small group homes, but we have um, the bulk of our developmental disabilities folks are living with home providers, so they're able to just do what a regular family member would do. A lot of them are working, and we support them to work. Um, okay. Uh, so. Well, I'll end it by thank you, thanking you for your dedication for, for what, 1973 and sticking with it because I, <laughs> I also know you, you're in a field that has a high turnover uh, generally just because of the very nature of it. So mm -hmm. uh, you, you've really stuck with it for the people well, in the area. Yeah. I, I couldn't think of a better place to work. I work with wonderful people every day who, um, who really do the best they can for the folks they serve. And uh, yeah, I've been very proud to work there and have put, been putting off my retirement because I really hadn't wanted to leave, but I do have some other things I want to do. Okay, well, thank you so for thank coming So thank you, on. Scott. Thank, thank you very you much. Yep. And thank you to the viewers for tuning in to another segment of the Northeast Kingdom Voice.